record. Okay. Um, so, um, okay, let me briefly introduce uh, Charles. Uh, Charles, um, Charles Rothkopf earned his PhD in philosophy from the University of Virginia in 2014. Uh, if I'm not, if I'm correct with um, uh, Paul Humphreys, and which was followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at the Graduate Center at uh, New York uh, University. Uh, he then worked for three years as assistant professor at Iona College in New York, but uh, recently moved to Germany to take up a research associate position at the Institute for Neuroscience and Medicine at the Forschungszentrum Jülich. And he is interested in uh, what minds are, how they evolved, and what we can learn about them. So he is a recipient of the best article by a recent PhD award, award from the Philosophy of Science Association and has won major grants from the National Science Foundation in the US and from the American Council of Learn, Learned Societies. Uh, his work has been published in Synthes, uh, Biology and Philosophy and Philosophy of Science, among others. Uh, today he will be talking about his uh, most recent work the title of the talk is Can, Can Read Minds by Imaging Brains. And before I give the con to uh, Charles, I would like to ask everybody who hasn't done so far to mute themselves. And if you have any questions uh, for the Q&A, just type Q in the chat, and then I will go uh, afterwards and uh, uh, give you an opportunity to ask your questions uh, in a chronological order, all right? Okay, so without further ado, Charles. Well, uh, thank you again very much. Uh, in particular, thanks to Hank, Leon, Mark, Kevet, and Daniel, of course, uh, for organizing this. Um, I mentioned a moment ago that this is an enormous um, honor to be part of the lecture series because uh, all of the other participants are famous. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Anyway, this talk is uh, in two parts, you could say. Um, let's see if I can get going. Here we go. And the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, for something like half of the talk, um, I have two collaborators, Beat Heinrichs and Jan Hendrik Heinrichs. Uh, we've written a paper together, which roughly corresponds to the first half of what I'll say today, and not exactly them. Um, the second half of the talk is uh, not yet a complete paper. It's uh, more speculative and uh, there are plenty of kinks to be worked out. So I'm particularly interested in uh, hearing your criticisms and questions there. But of course, I look forward to any sort of discussion that we can have uh, at the end. Um, here we go. So here's kind of a, here's an analogy that, that might help you understand uh, the logic of the talk. Um, whenever we ask whether a particular future technology is possible or not, um, the answer is going to be sensitive to uh, the way that we imagine the technology. So take an example, if we're talking 200 years ago about human flight, uh, is it possible? Well, the answer is yes, if, you're, if you've got airplanes in mind and if you are thinking about the sort of thing that Superman does, then the answer is presumably no. Uh, I think there's a similar sort of two-part answer with mind reading. Uh, mind reading is possible? Yes, if you're talking about an empirically grounded sort of mind reading, which I'll try to articulate, um, and no, if you're talking about reading beliefs. And so the positive answer roughly corresponds to the first half of what I'll say, and the negative answer roughly corresponds to the second half. Here's a plan uh, for the talk. I'll start by uh, refining a folk concept, mind reading. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about decoding experiments. I'll give an argument that uh, real mind reading, as you might call it, is easier than you think. Um, I'll talk about the role of propositional content in mind reading and its relation to decoding experiments. 
And uh, then I'll give an argument that uh, a more um, fanciful form of mind reading is not possible. Okay, so refining a folk concept. Um, <clears throat> if you look in the popular media these days, you can see uh, pretty wild claims about what neuroscientists have managed to do by means of brain imaging. Uh, Facebook can literally read your mind and decode your thoughts. Uh, it's easy to find similar sentiments. But it's also easy to find uh, exactly the opposite sort of view. Um, the idea that fMRI uh, enables neuroscientists to read your mind is laughably false. Well, um, it may be that neither of these two uh, hyperbolic sounding perspectives uh, is quite right, but we can't at the moment uh, figure out who's closer to the truth because uh, the term mind reading or the concept of mind reading is um, lacking in empirical content. That is, it's been taken from uh, fictional and science fictional contexts and imported into cognitive neuroscience. Um, but it hasn't been imported in in a way that, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't figure in um, sophisticated scientific theories, right? So we don't have the option of uh, looking at the predictions that are made from theories in which the theoretical term mind reading figures as an important uh, component. Uh, it's, so it's just a folk term. Now, when you have just a, a folk psychological term uh, that doesn't have sort of a scientific history behind it, then merely providing a definition is unlikely to be helpful, or at least it's not likely to get us very far. Um, so what we want to give instead is an explication. The uh, concept of explication goes back to Carnap, but basically the idea is that we should say what the term ought to mean, given uh, the concerns we have about it, given the kinds of questions we want to ask about the phenomenon that we're trying to point to. Um, we should try to develop the concept, refine the concept, such that it does a good job of expressing those concerns. Um, so what's the difference between a good explication and a bad one? Well, I think in this case, a good explanation, uh, sorry, explication will first of all respect the sources of fascination that people have with the phenomenon of mind reading, with the question, can a neuroscientist or will a neuroscientist soon be able to read my mind by analyzing my brain data? Um, if you don't respect the fascination behind the question, then uh, there's a danger that the analysis will devolve into something more like uh, stipulation rather than uh, explication. Um, and the other mark of a good explication will be that it'll help us to resolve that debate I mentioned between the booster who says that uh, you know, neuroscientists uh, can already read your mind, and the skeptic who says that we're a long, long way away from anything like that actually happening. Okay. Um, so what, what are the sources of fascination? Well, um, there have been a few publications, uh, one by Dina Roskies, for example, where the suggestion is that the primary source of fascination is an ethical one. People are concerned that uh, if mind reading were achieved, uh, we would have to worry about a practical ethical concern where people's thoughts would be, um, let's say, discerned against their will. Um, I think there's something to this. It would be amazing if you could understand the relationship between brain data and mental content so thoroughly 
that voluntary participation were not necessary in order to discern that content. That would be a theoretical or scientifically uh, unbelievable achievement. But I don't actually think that there's much of a practical ethical concern here. After all, imaging equipment is not very portable. And when you bring someone into a room to lie down in a scanner, um, it's, it's, as far as I know, always a, a voluntary process. Um, but I'd like to offer another analysis of what it is um, that fascinates us about the question. And my alternative is that it overcomes a constraint on uh, the acquisition of knowledge about other minds, a constraint that has always been presumed uh, to be there. Um, and that is traditionally to get information about other minds, or at least detailed information about other minds, you need the person whose mind it is to speak or write or sign, or in some way engage in a conventionally supported symbolic communication, right? They, they have to um, translate the thought that they're having into a form that, uh, in, in the most obvious case, is, is um, translated into a natural language and then uh, communicated by means of symbols. And so what's, what's fascinating about the prospect of neuroscientific mind reading is the idea that we might be able to circumvent that need for convention. Is there a way to get at the thoughts of a person that is somehow more pure or more direct um, in virtue of the fact that it has uh, circumvented this need for conventional communication? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Non-conventional symbols. So if we add uh, as a first condition in our explication of neuroscientific mind reading, this idea that you cannot use conventional symbols, um, we've already said something non-trivial. And I just want to highlight the non-trivial nature of this contribution by showing that um, it, it rules out some cases that you might otherwise be tempted to rule in, or at least at first glance, you might be tempted to rule in. So one is um, the alter ego device um, that's being developed by uh, MIT. Um, there are other devices like this, but the basic idea is to um, interpret from the outside uh, neural signals uh, and send them into a smartphone so that your thoughts, your, the, 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 uh, the text message that you want to communicate to somebody else um, can be communicated without you having to type it, type it out with your fingers. Um, now, the way that these devices work uh, is by reading myoelectric signals in the face and sometimes in the neck. Um, so these are signals that are, are basically sub-vocalization signatures, right? So once you've sub-vocalized uh, a sentence, you know, meet me for pizza at six o'clock, um, it already has been cast in terms of a natural language. So it's already got the mark of convention. So, so this, this uh, first condition rules out those sorts of cases. Here's another kind of interesting case. Um, it's a little bit unclear how, how far people have come uh, in this sort of work um, because it's been tarnished by some allegations of scientific misconduct recently. But, but here's the basic idea. You have patients with ALS um, who, uh, who have, um, retain their cognitive powers, but um, can't move anymore, or can move only very, very little if they're in advanced stage of the disease. And uh, you can use various imaging technologies, such as, for example, functional near, near infrared spectroscopy, 
uh, targeting Broca's area. And then you can set up a, a conventional form of communication like this. Um, you know, Broca's area will be differentially active when you engage in an effort for linguistic tasks to imagine count backwards from 100, right? If you do that, relative to baseline, Broca's area will be active. Uh, and then you could, you could sort of lower the baseline to get a signal that's maximally uh, opposed to the high effort signal by asking the patient to do something like just imagine a placid lake. Um, now you've got a zero and a one, a yes and a no. And you could just uh, agree, doctor and patient could just agree that they can use those, um, that binary system to communicate uh, you know, for example, a patient could answer yes, no questions. So this is um, a little bit like mind reading, but we're going to rule it out because you've turned your brain into a convention covered, uh, convention governed signaling device. It's not, it's not natural language per se, it's more like a form of binary, but it's clearly a convention mediated form of communication. Okay, um, now I said I'm not interested in, in, in definition per se. Nevertheless, um, it's worth looking up the word. So if you go to dictionary.com, you'll see uh, mind reading is defined as follows. It is the ability to discern the thoughts of others without the normal means of communication. And I think this is actually uh, pretty good. It's a helpful start. Um, but we have to figure out what the normal means of communication uh, entails or includes. Um, and it does seem important that we uh, sort of rigorously rule out any form of uh, normal means of communication because otherwise, instead of mind reading, you'll have something that might be better described as um, normal, uh, behavior interpretation supplemented with brain data. So, um, all right, so how do we uh, rule out the normal means of communication? Well, let's, let's think about communication as having uh, a process with sort of two parts, so roughly the part that corresponds to the subject or the patient uh, or the participant and the part that corresponds to the researcher or the interpreter, right? So there's a, there's a sender and a receiver. Um, and so communication involves sending some sort of information and then interpreting that information. And we can derive a necessary condition from each of those sort of halves of the communicative um, game. So on the, on the sending side, um, Maybe the best way to introduce this idea is just uh, for a moment, compare mind reading uh, in the sense that, that we're talking about it now with mind reading in the sense that it's often uh, discussed uh, in social cognition, right? Mind reading, and you'll notice I've, I've, I'm using, the, I'm spelling the word mind reading as two words, uh, mind reading with no space, uh, I, I'm using that to designate you know, roughly theory of mind, that sort of social cognitive skill. Uh, when, when you and I interpret each other, the input to the process is behavior, right? It's the observation of behavior, sometimes linguistic behavior, sometimes other forms of behavior. Um, that's not what we mean, right? That's what we want to rule out. For neuroscientific mind reading, we want the input to be exclusively neural data, right? If, if our goal is to rule out normal means of communication, then we wanna rule out behavior as an input and try to get as close as possible to relying exclusively on uh, neural data uh, to, to derive our uh, claim about the kind of mental content uh, that we think a person has. Okay, um, so that's the sender side. Now, what about the interpretation side, the receiver side? Uh, well, we don't want to rely on our quite impressive powers of human social cognition. Um, you know, humans are, uh, 
are excellent interpreters of other humans and we can bring all sorts of uh, information to bear on um, what a person is likely thinking about at a given point in time. We, we, we can impute content to one another rather than decode it, rather than read it. Um, and we want to rule this sort of thing out as well. So just here's, you know, the, the, the literature from, from the 60s and 70s is full of examples like this. Um, in particular, the, the literature about, um, about the principle of charity and about holism and belief of, about um, uh, Quinean indeterminacy. There are lots of interesting examples like this. Uh, elephants don't enjoy bowling. Um, you know, that's something that you probably all believe, uh, but you know, you've, there's probably no stimulus I can find, a particular stimulus that uh, I can point to that you know, uh, caused you to have that belief. I'm, I'm imputing that belief to you on the basis of my uh, assumption that you're rational and have, you know, sort of average beliefs about elephants and bowling. Okay. <clears throat> so we've already introduced um, three main ideas. Uh, there's sort of a fourth idea here, which is that uh, if we're going to resolve the kind of debate between the skeptics and the boosters, um, we want to do it in terms of something empirical, right? We, we want whatever concept we end up with to have some empirical content. So the claim, uh, you know, such and such an experiment has achieved neuroscientific mind reading, that should be something that is answerable to evidence. So mind reading is going to have to involve some kind of predictive achievement, right? Empirical content, for, for, for a claim to have empirical content means something like um, there are uh, conceivable circumstances in which you could show that it's wrong. Okay, so we need some kind of prediction. Um, now, the, the sorts of experiments I'm thinking of uh, can get very, very complicated and they can have multiple layers. For my purposes, I think I can stick with a super simple picture. So you're putting someone in a scanner, you're presenting them with some simple behavioral task. Let's, I mean, you can use other modalities, but let's assume we're talking about vision. You present them with some images, let's say, and um, you have, uh, you record their, their response data from their brain. And you learn about the correlations between um, the presentation of images and the brain data. Uh, and, and once you've learned those correlations well enough, you could do one of two things. You could either try to look at similar images and predict the brain data that you're likely to see on a novel trial, or you could look at the brain data and try to predict which images uh, had, had generated or triggered that brain data. And decoding is the latter, right? Decoding is when you start with the brain data and predict the images. Encoding is when you go in the opposite direction. Um, and so for, for the purposes of reading, a, you know, we're thinking about uh, reading a person's mind on the basis of understanding their brain data or interpreting it, uh, decoding experiments are the more relevant ones. Now, I mentioned that point about this work being complicated because there are lots of examples where uh, you build an encoding model in order to improve a decoding model. So these two things are intimately connected. Okay, so just a super simple overview of what a generic simple kind of decoding experiment does. Um, so first of all, it'll use MVPA, uh, multivariate pattern analysis, plus some sort of uh, machine learning, some sort of uh, model that can learn correlations. And so MVPA uh, is to be contrasted with univariate analyses of brain data. 
Um, so the basic idea is that you're not looking just for an average high signal somewhere in the brain. You're looking at a particular distribution of activation values that form a pattern. And it's that pattern as a whole that you then correlate with the stimulus. Um, <clears throat> and in fMRI, uh, each element in a matrix that forms a pattern will be a voxel. Uh, but you know, it doesn't have to be fMRI. It could be something else. It could be even electrophysiology. Um, so each uh, activation pattern in whatever region of cortex you're looking at will uh, be represented as a single point in the high dimensional vector space or as a vector. Uh, and then all the activation patterns from a single experimental condition will form a cloud in that space. And what you then do is build uh, some sort of machine learning classifier that learns a decision boundary during the training phase of the experiment and then uses that decision boundary to make predictions in the testing phase of the experiment about whether a new piece of brain data was triggered by stimulus A or by stimulus B or by stimulus C and so on. Okay, that's the basic setup. Okay, so um, I've already built in um, most of what I want to say about the concept of mind reading. Um, I haven't given you any arguments yet, really, but um, before I give you my, my sort of official explication of, of mind reading, uh, I want to draw your attention to, to sort of a methodological point, a philosophical methodological point. Um, and it is that when you're doing something like refining a concept or analyzing a concept, you can proceed by trying to, you know, extensionally, you could say, by trying to find all of the things that properly fall under the scope of the concept and then properly exclude all the things that you might be tempted to include but don't quite fit, right? That's what this little picture is supposed to illustrate. But that's not the only way to go about understanding or refining your understanding of a concept. Um, you can also look to the cases that are purportedly um, within the extension of a concept and then try to understand how or whether those cases are organized with respect to each other in an interesting way. And this sort of internal uh, analysis is going to be particularly particularly useful in cases where the, um, there's some sort of natural ordering or gradient along which the uh, exemplars of the concept are organized. And I think there's something a bit like that going on in mind reading. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is give you four dimensions that are sort of intuitive, maybe um, inspired a little bit by uh, the statistical analysis of decoding experiments, but not technical. Um, so, so just four ideas or four dimensions along which you might say uh, decoding experiments could be more proficient, you know, closer to the platonic ideal of mind reading or farther away from that platonic ideal. And by, by having these four uh, dimensions in mind, I think we'll have a richer understanding of, of the concept or, or we'll do better at refining. So the first of these four dimensions is granularity. This is pretty simple. Um, first pass, we'll just say that the number of stimuli that a classifier can discriminate in a perceptual task, well, the, the more that you can discriminate, the better, the more fine grained your analysis is. Um, this isn't quite right. We don't want to just count the stimuli. Um, what I'm going to say instead is that it's the number of properties of an experimental condition that you can predict or discriminate. Um, and here's the reason. 
uh, let's say you have a visual search task and uh, I ask you in this complex uh, scene to search for people. Uh, I'm going to get one pattern of you know, neural activation. I'll get one kind of brain data, uh, one pattern of brain data. But if I give you a different task, I tell you to search for the cars in the scene, I'm going to get a different uh, you know, neural response. Um, and so here you have exactly one stimulus, but you have different neural responses. So, and that's just because, you know, the, the, the condition, the experimental condition I mentioned was different. So I just want to generalize from this idea and say, um, you are, granularity refers to the number of experimental, number of properties of the experimental condition that you could predict. You could think of other examples like maybe the order in which stimuli were presented within a condition, you could try to predict that, you know, lots of other things. Okay. Um, yeah, this I basically already said. Um, okay, yeah. Second dimension along which uh, the proficiency of uh, mind reading, uh, the proficiency with which a decoding experiment could reach mind reading uh, is generalizability. So this is basically the idea, how closely does the training data resemble the, the training data resemble the testing data? So if I, um, you know, train my classifier on uh, one task with uh, one set of stimuli and test on exactly the same task with exactly the same stimuli, then, you know, it's not super surprising that I'll have some success. But if I vary uh, the testing data systematically, it, it'll get more and more impressive. Uh, and in particular, one of the kinds of generalizability that people have been interested in in decoding experiments is generalizing over uh, the participants. So you could have uh, participants, you know, you have one group of participants for training and a different group of participants for testing. Uh, and that's kind of a cool, a particularly cool kind of generalizability. And maybe the most extreme kind um, would be where you have a clinical population so that the uh, testing group and the training group differ not randomly, but systematically. So there was one example of this, uh, HERC 2017. They trained, they trained a model on auditory stimulus categories in sighted, uh, sorry, in, in blind uh, subjects and then tested uh, with success on uh, sighted subjects. Um, when you do this kind of thing though, you do face a trade-off, uh, which is that uh, you're gonna be capable, your model is gonna be capable of finding uh, much less structure in the neural signal and therefore you're going to get much less granularity. So in this particular case, only four stimulus categories were used. Uh, now that, this idea, well actually I'll leave that because I've already been speaking for half an hour. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just jump right ahead. Um, okay, third property is stimulus independence. So this is, or a third dimension of stimulus independence, how tight is the dependence relationship between uh, the measurement event or the context in which the neural measurement is made and the mental content itself? Um, so the most, well, one extreme kind of case here would be a mind wandering experiment where instead of presenting particular stimuli uh, and then trying to learn the associ association between those stimuli and, um, and the neural data, you could, you know, just have people look at a fixation cross and say, think of whatever you want, and I'll try to, you know, make some guess about what you're thinking about. Uh, and there have been a few attempts at this, but, um, you know, that, that's very, very hard to do. Uh, so not too much mm, progress yet. Uh, or here's another example. Um, you know, if my, uh, if the content that I'm trying to predict uh, arises from a stimulus that is back in time by, let's say, 20 seconds, 
in some NBAC task. Um, that's a, that has some degree of stimulus independence because the brain activity um, that's sort of most directly related, uh, or sorry, the um, stimulus that's most directly related in time to the neural activity I'm measuring is not the stimulus that's giving me the content I'm trying to predict. So that's a little bit of stimulus dependence, whereas if I try to um, predict what it is that you ate for dinner last Monday, when I ask you to just sort of recall your dinner and have some image of it, that's uh, a much more impressive degree of stimulus independence. Um, so roughly the idea here is that um, stimulus independence means that the content will be influenced by factors on which you cannot train your model. Uh, I'll mention just one um, experiment here uh, that did a particularly cool job of increasing the amount of stimulus independence uh, or increasing it relative to what you normally see in decoding experiments. So Risman et al. 2017 had subjects wear cameras on their head for three weeks. And these cameras took photographs randomly. And uh, then they brought the subjects in and they showed them photos uh, both from their own camera and from the cameras of the other participants. And then they tried to decode on the basis of the brain data, which uh, pictures came from the participant's own camera and which came from someone else's. And they got near perfect accuracy there. So that's a clever experiment uh, in which you're mixing data from outside the immediate experimental context in with the data that you have, you know, that you're presenting to, or the stimuli that you're presenting to the subject uh, in the experiment itself in order to increase the um, stimulus independence of the mental content that you are discerning. Okay, um, and then the fourth dimension is uh, sort of the shape of the priors. Um, so just for an intuitive example here, imagine that you go visit a psychic and the psychic asks you, you know, who is, uh, I don't know, Hjerit? Uh, and that's just a popular name in uh, your area of the Netherlands. And, um, you know, you in fact know someone by that name. Uh, has the psychic read your mind? Well, no, uh, the psychic is sort of relying on background knowledge about, um, you know, popular names. So sometimes decoding experiments do something quite like this. Uh, here's an example from Huth et al., uh, 2016. Um, this was a very, th so this was a cool experiment because on the dimension of granularity, it scores incredibly high. Uh, they gave two hours of movie clips, um, short movie clips, two hours altogether. Um, each movie clip was labeled. So, you know, if the clip shows a car, you would get car, and if it shows an umbrella, there would be an explicit label umbrella. And uh, you try to learn from the brain data uh, the, the labels that went along with the movie clips that triggered that brain data. But uh, some of the labels, since there are so many, are logically related to one another. So one example is station wagon and car. Uh, so a station wagon is just a type of car. And um, so the model would be doing something sort of logically problematic if it predicted that the probability that the brain data was caused by a station wagon is higher than the probability that it was caused by a car. That's logically impossible. So um, what they did is they sort of fixed that by hand coding logical or hand coding the probabilities of uh, relationships between conceptually related labels. So in this case, it would just be like the probability that a station wagon caused the data can never be higher than the probability that a car caused the data. And if you build in conditional probabilities like that, um, you are making the task of prediction considerably easier, right? So the distance between, uh, you know, the input and the output gets smaller, the big, you know, the more information you pack into the priors. 
Whereas if you have no priors, you just have you know, a flat probability distribution over the possible stimuli that could have caused the data, then the predictive achievement is more impressive. Okay, so <clears throat> that was uh, all, of the, um, all of the information that I need to build my little argument that uh, mind reading is easy. So now I'll just tie, tie the strings together here. Um, so here's the explication that I think we should end up with. It says that neuroscientific mind reading is discerning mental content from a prediction about some property of an experimental condition. And we wanted that, remember, because we want the concept to have empirical content. Um, and then there are some restrictions on this prediction. In particular, there are three necessary conditions that I articulated at the beginning. One was that um, it should be free from conventional symbols. Uh, it should be driven by the neural data rather than behavior. And it should not impute propositional content based on general knowledge of human social cognition. Okay. Now, um, notice that none of the stuff I was just saying about the four dimensions enters into this explication. Um, what I want to say is that every single decoding experiment uh, that I know of uh, will satisfy, uh, well, sorry, no, that's too much. Not every single decoding experiment will satisfy this explication, but every single decoding experiment will um, sort of register on the scale of the four dimensions that I just mentioned, right? It will have some degree of granularity even if it's very low. It will have some degree of generalizability, even if it's very low. It'll have some degree of stimulus independence, et cetera. Um, and so what I wanna say is that as we organize all the different decoding experiments that you could imagine with respect to one another along these four dimensions, um, they're gonna be better and better and better but there's gonna be no magical cutoff point where you go from merely interpreting brain data to seeing what is in the mind of the subject, right? That, that, that is kind of a, uh, I, I think that we are all, myself included, sort of tempted by a form of magical thinking here, that there is going to be some hard threshold in the space of possible improvements that we can make in decoding experiments, whereby once we cross the threshold, it'll be real, um, genuine mind reading. And I'm gonna say, no, it's all a continuum. It's all gradual. And the implication of that is that once, is, is that this, this explication I've given on the previous slide is, is all you need, that's the whole story. So if, if your question is, you know, when will we eventually reach mind reading? The answer is 2001, 19 years ago. Uh, James Haxby et al, 2001, famous, uh, you know, one of the earliest papers in this area, um, where Haxby was able to decode whether a person was looking at a face or not from areas outside of the fusiform face area. Um, yeah, so, so uh, on, on the view I'm arguing for, mind reading is in some sense old news, but that's not meant to be deflationary. It's just meant to say that, um, you know, uh, the ways in which mind reading can be improved um, are many. There are many dimensions of improvement. There, there's no um, particular, there isn't going to be a particular day in the future when we finally succeeded. Okay, so that's my argument that mind reading is easy. Now I've got a couple of objections, um, but I think I'll skip this one because I'm going to run out of time. Um, now, cognitive neuroscientists, like I said, have not talked about what mind reading is in a lot of detail. There are a few 
places, but they haven't sort of theorized in the uh, in the way I'm trying to do here about what what mind reading is. There's a paper from Nasolaris and Tom, 2012, where they distinguish between brain reading and mind reading. And they, there they say that you only get genuine mind reading if the content is fundamentally private and subjective. So their rate, you know, I was lowering the bar and they're raising the bar really high. So just think for a moment about what that means, that you only get real mind reading if the content that you've decoded is uh, fundamentally private and subjective. Well, um, first of all, this is a little bit ambiguous because if you say that um, it only counts as mind reading if the content is of that kind, well, presumably that's a relatively small fraction of all possible thought that you could have thought that's fundamentally private and subjective, right? Any thought that I've already communicated then couldn't be decoded. Um, so I, I, I presume that what they mean is that um, the kind of experimental design that you're using has to um, be capable of decoding thoughts, which otherwise are only accessible if the subject voluntarily decides to introspect and then give you a verbal report on that introspection, right? So fundamentally private means something like um, first personal verbal report is the only other way to do it. Uh, okay, so I uh, remember this is an explication, right? This is not, so, so the, there's a pragmatic element to what to what I'm trying to do. Um, and I think that raising the bar that high is um, inappropriate because it undermines the empir empirical content of the concept. So think about the most interesting kinds of cases where we would want uh, to use an algorithmic data-driven method to find out what a person is really thinking. Well, um, let me give you an example. Uh, there's, a, there's been a debate going on for, you know, 120 years about whether people dream in color or in black and white. Okay, now it would be really cool if we could somehow use neural data to just answer that question once and for all. However, uh, it's exactly in those sorts of interesting cases where self-knowledge itself comes into doubt. Uh, so in this case, um, I'm sure many of you know this already, uh, for, you, know, you, you can go back in the philosophical literature on dreaming and people talk about color regularly uh, before the 20th century. Then once black and white TV becomes popular, people start reporting that they dream in black and white, not exclusively, but I don't know, 80% or something. Uh, and then, you know, in the 60s, later 60s and 70s, People took this up again once uh, Technicolor uh, television became uh, popular and all of a sudden people started dreaming in color again. So you might think, of course, that this was, uh, you know, and, and in fact, some psychologists have said this, that, uh, you know, exposure to black and white TV causes your dreams to be black and white. But I think the, the, the sober analysis is that people just aren't good at clearly articulating the nature of their dreams, and um, they are, you know, swayed by the media of the day. So self-knowledge is what is in question. People just don't know whether they're dreaming in black and white, or if that's even uh, an appropriate way of describing uh, dreams. And so if those are the kinds of questions we want to answer, um, There, there just isn't, we're not going to get one. There, there is no uh, empirical answer to at least many of the interesting questions that are fundamentally private in the sense that I think Maslaris and Tom have in mind. Okay. Um, now, the, here's where the talk becomes more um, speculative. How am I on time? I've got um, only about 10 minutes left. Is that right? Um. I think you're good, maybe 15. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so 
I, I'm sure many of you have already uh, realized that um, predicting a particular stimulus is not exactly the same thing as describing the nature of the thought that was triggered by that stimulus. Um, so I think that there is a, a problem here, which I haven't really wrapped my head around completely, but um, I'm going to try to wrap my head around it. But I just wanted to give you this one literary reference because I think it expresses sort of my intuitions here quite, quite nicely. Um, so in, in Harry Potter, uh, Snape says, you have no subtlety, Potter, you do not understand fine distinctions. Only muggles talk of mind reading. Mind is not a book to be opened at will and examined at leisure. Thoughts are not etched on the inside of skulls to be perused by any invader. Um, so Snape is the guy that actually said that. But uh, ever since I read that, I've always thought it, it, it could very well have been this guy instead who said it. Uh, it, it seems like there is a temptation to uh, imagine thoughts as things that are inscribed on the inside of the head and that decoding experiments are, um, yeah, just translating those inscriptions into another language which we can write down on the outside. Now, I am not a Wittgensteinian, um, and I'm certainly not an ordinary language kind of philosopher, but I think there might be something to this kind of worry, the sorts of worries that Jonathan Bennett, for example, has sort of extracted from Wittgenstein and uh, you know, brought into contact with neuroscientists. Um, so that, that's just a, a brief claim about my intuitions in this area. Now I'll try to develop an actual argument. Um, all right, so uh, how important is it that predicting a stimulus is just not obviously not equivalent to predicting propositional content? Um, well, you know, you might think that we could fix this problem easily, right? Think about the actual output of a model on a computer screen when you predict the stimulus. What's actually being predicted is a label for the stimulus. And that could be a, well, I mean, it could be a numerical label, but let's assume here it's a, it's a verbal label. So there's a stimulus with an umbrella in it and the label that's printed out is umbrella. So um, I could just tell the computer, uh, you know, because I know it's a vision experiment, so I can use, I can exploit that little bit of background knowledge to say, instead of printing out umbrella, just print the sentence, I see an umbrella. Okay, and now we have a proposition rather than a, a, a stimulus. Now, this is obviously a cheap trick that has added no insight into the nature of uh, the thought. And I kind of think that there's a, uh, a general problem here. There's sort of a slippery slope argument um, that we should not insist that the output of the pr prediction is a proposition. I think it's okay to, to, to leave it at predicting uh, the stimulus or some other property of the experimental condition. So imagine, you know, this is the stimulus, I see a chair. Someone could say, um, you know, I predict I see a chair, that's my proposition. The subject could then subsequently disagree with me and say, no, 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 I didn't see a chair, I saw a Barcelona chair. Uh, and then you could run the same trick. No, no, I didn't see a Barcelona chair. I saw the original Barcelona chair, which was designed by Mies van der Goel. Uh, now, if you insist uh, that the model, the model output has propositional format, there's always going to be some kind of reliance on this phenomenological introspective self-report in order to check whether the proposition that I've generated matches the uh, actual mental content. But I think that precisely for that reason, um, you know, there can be this, uh, well, I think it's over-reliance on, let me rephrase, this reliance on um, introspection, self-report, and thereby on self-knowledge um, 
reduces the degree of empirical content in the concept of mind reading. So I think it's better if we uh, don't insist that the model actually has propositional content as its output. Okay, now here's, here's the main negative argument. You might think that beliefs are special because they're essentially propositional. Right? Not all mental content, I presume, is essentially propositional. If I say I'm thinking of a number between one and 10, uh, you know, can you guess what it is? And I'm fixated on the number seven. There might not be any particular proposition. There's just the number seven. But beliefs, you might think, are essentially propositional. Why is that? Well, to, to, to borrow a famous phrase, um, beliefs aim at the truth. They have correctness conditions and they have them essentially. What it is to be a belief is to be the kind of mental state that aims at getting things right. So um, in order to get things right, or what it means to get things right is to be truth evaluable. Um, and to be truth evaluable, you have to have a propositional format, right? Because propositions are the kinds of things that have truth values. So if you wanna read a person's beliefs, the output of the prediction really has to be a proposition. Okay, now just a couple of uh, observations about the way beliefs work. Um, lots of the recent philosophy of mind that tries to model rational uh, belief acquisition uh, comments on the fact that however beliefs are stored, uh, in the brain, it can't be that each one is encoded individually because there just isn't enough space, right? And all sorts of examples from the history of philosophy of mind literature show this, you know, the, the simplest one is just, you know, you believe that uh, the number one is smaller than the number two, you also believe it's smaller than the number three, now keep going. Um, you have an infinite number of beliefs. Um, so, you know, belief information in your brain has to be stored in some sort of fragmented format. Uh, most beliefs, most of the time, are not available for explicit expression, for explicit conscious evaluation or communication without the contrib contribution of what I'll call a, a proposition compiler. So some mechanism in the mind, and supposedly in the brain, or presumably in the brain, has to take the pre-proposition content and turn it into a proposition so that it can be uh, you know, worked with in a rational way. Um, if the so, so here's now my dilemma for uh, the for, for, for the prospect of reading beliefs by means of you know, decoding experiment. Uh, the dilemma splits into two sorts of cases. One case is that um, the proposition has already been compiled by the proposition compiler, and the other case it hasn't. So um, if the proposition has already been compiled, then um, it, it's already expressed in some sense, right? Um, it might be that you have subvocalized it. Uh, in your sort of internal monologue while you're considering whether it's true or false. Uh, or it could be that you've actually spoken it out loud, or it could be that somebody has flashed a uh, sentence on a screen and you have then participated in a task where you say, yes, I believe that, no, I don't believe that, um, or whatever it is. In, in some sense, you have um, given evidence of your attitude towards a proposition. Um, but of course, in all of those cases, we are going to be violating the restriction I started with early in the talk uh, against using conventional symbols. Of course, a nod of your head is very different from speaking, but you know, anyone who's been to India will, uh, will confirm that nodding of the head is a very conventional thing. It means different things in different places. Similarly, a button press, you know, this, the red button could mean yes, or it could be no, you know, that's a form of convention. Um, okay, so then it looks like uh, the proposition has to be in the pre-proposition, or, or the, sorry, the uh, belief information 
that we're extracting or reading from the brain data has to be coming from uh, pre-propositional content. Oops. Okay. So if the proposition has not yet been compiled and made explicit in some format, um, then the model will not have had any opportunity during the training phase to associate propositional content with neural data. So if you haven't given the model the chance to build up correlations between neural activation data and propositions, how do you uh, generate propositional content as a prediction? Well, here's one way to do it. Um, you could first just do what we've been doing the whole time and predict the stimulus. You know, I predict that the subject at time t saw a picture of an umbrella and that's what generated the brain data that I'm interpreting. Uh, and then you could run a second model on that picture of the umbrella and try to generate propositional content. And there are cool apps that do this. Um, so Microsoft has an app called Seeing AI, which is designed for blind people. And what they can do is they take a picture of a friend or a scene or whatever, and then um, the output is a, a description of, of what they see. And um, you could imagine sort of adjusting that kind of um, image captioning AI, it's called, uh, in order to um, express what a person likely believes about the picture given that he or she has seen this picture in this experimental context. That's one way you could generate propositional content. But of course, systems like that are trained on large amounts of data about what humans typically say about images of that kind. So this solution is gonna violate the restriction against imputing content that I talked about at the beginning. Okay, so this is my last slide. Um, I've been thinking about this stuff for quite a, a while now, but I don't have a very firm conclusion. Here, here's a, so here, here are two conclusions you could draw from what I've said so far. One is the strong view, which says that beliefs in general cannot be read. So mind reading is only possible if the content that you're talking about is uh, non-belief-like content. Because any method you use of generating because first of all, beliefs are essentially propositional. And second of all, if you, any method you use of generating proposition is gonna violate one of the three necessary conditions that I offered at the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm, I find that an enticing view. I'm not sure I believe it yet. Um, here's a weaker thesis. Um, this might seem like it's a little bit off in left field, but I think it's at least worth relating. Um, so I'll take, a, 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 take an example from um, uh, a, an old article by Dan Dennett in, in 1975 called uh, Brain Writing and Mind Reading. So he tells us about this character, Tom the, uh, Tom the art dealer, who has a son who's a painter. And his son produces mediocre paintings. They're not great. Nevertheless, Sam, the art dealer, the father, promotes this work as if it's top quality and he tries to sell it for, uh, you know, high prices, etc. And um, it's so it's from the outside, it's unclear whether Sam believes that his son's work is really top quality uh, and that his judgment has been uh, biased by his love and loyalty for his son and resulted in this genuine belief that the work is top quality or whether his actual belief is that the son's work is really not very good but he's going to pretend like it is good because that has uh, you know instrumental benefits for his son. Now it might be that Sam lives his entire life without exhibiting any behavior that would allow you to uh, figure out which of those two hypotheses is correct. Does he believe that the painting is excellent or does he believe that the painting is mediocre? 
And you might, one thing you might have hoped for uh, mind reading technology is that it would be able to resolve the difference between exactly these sorts of cases where you're, you're worried about self-deception. You can't tell whether Sam, Sam's belief is a case of self-deception or uh, it's just a case of instrumental lying. Um, and I think that the, the, the observations I've made about the nature of belief uh, suggest that mind reading will never be able to reconcile cases like these. Um, the reason is that you would have to train a model on behavioral data in which this distinction has already been reconciled. Right? You would have to feed the model with cases of uh, apparent self-deception that you antecedently know to be self-deception. And then you'd have to train the model with cases of uh, outright lying that you know antecedently to be outright lying. But it's precisely because behavior is not capable of resolving the difference for us that we won't have the training data necessary to build a machine that could then make that call for us. Okay, so like I said, I'm not entirely sure how to wrap up my uh, discussion of belief here, but I think that there is an interesting skeptical thesis to be drawn from uh, the observations about the necessary propositional character of beliefs. And with that, I'll say thank you very much. And there's a lot of references. All right, thank you, Charles. Uh, I'm sure everyone is applauding in their own rooms, uh, <laughs> even though they're <laughs> muted. And um, okay, so this was a really interesting talk, uh, as always. And uh, so we're now open for Q&A. Uh, so the first one actually was from Yulene Franken because she had to leave earlier and she apologizes. Uh, but she wanted to ask a question nevertheless and then since we are recording, she will have a chance to hear your response and maybe. Oh, yeah. So she asks uh, this. Mm. Uh, in decoding experiments, a statistical threshold is used to determine whether decoding is possible. For example, if it's uh, less than 50% uh, in case of two category decoding, where does this prediction accuracy, let's say 51% uh, versus 81% fit into your considerations about what we ought in brackets not to call mind reading? Yeah, okay, that's a very good question. So I gave those four dimensions along which proficiency could be measured. Uh, you could just add accuracy as a fifth dimension. Um, I didn't do that because I thought it might be a little bit trivial, right? Like obviously you want accuracy, but um, yeah, for sure. That, that is not something where I see any reason to uh, impose 50% uh, as you know, a numerical, I mean, well, like in a sense, yeah, of course, you, you need to have better than pure chance. I, yeah, so I suppose in that sense, there is a requirement that accuracy be non-zero, um, right? There, there has to be some information in the statistical sense uh, in the prediction. But I also don't see, you know, that 100% accuracy in every trial on every subject is a reasonable thing to impose as a necessary condition. Because after all, you know, when we interpret uh, one another in, in non-neuroscientific context, we make mistakes and we don't conclude from the fact that we occasionally make mistakes that we have no access to the thoughts of other people. Um, and then furthermore, I think imposing any particular numerical threshold between you know, chance and perfection, that just seems a bit you know, uh, unmotivated. Let me just mute myself. All right, thanks. Uh, so I would like to remind everybody, if you want to ask a question, just type Q in the chat. Uh, and so I will see it and uh, give you a chance to ask a question. Uh, also, Charles, you can you can perhaps stop sharing your screen so we can have you oh, yeah, sure. on big screen now. And if necessary, later, you can share it mm -hmm. again. 
Um, so while we are waiting for some questions, I, I have some. Oh, all right. Mark Slores has a question. Misspelled. Sorry about that. So thanks a lot for this very. This is great talk. It was absolutely. Uh, it's really, 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 really nice. Um, I have oh, I have a question about the last bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, to what extent are you? I was actually thinking about uh, uh, Trump as a, a, a as a similar kind of example. Does the guy really believe that he won the election? Is there? A, <laughs> and, and then I was thinking, are you are you actually? Um, I so are you not really saying? Um, that the whole concept of belief might just not be the right kind of thing to look for in the brain. And, and wasn't that actually Dan Dannett's intention uh, to convey in the first place? So how skeptical is your skepticism? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, it, it's, it's a perfectly appropriate question. I'm, I'm sort of broadly speaking a fan of Dennett's way of thinking about intentional content. Mm. Um, mm. But so he, by the way, has read this paper. Um, <clears throat> and, and he gave me some comments on it, but uh, it did not include that last part. Oh. So uh, I, I don't know exactly how he would take it, but um, I think that uh, his view is unclear about uh, commitments to, or put it this way, I think he's sort of tried to remain pretty neutral with regard to uh, how belief-like information is instantiated in the brain. Um, and that seems entirely reasonable. Uh, so I guess I'm going beyond, I guess I, I see this argument as going beyond the, the sort of view that beliefs are simply not the kinds of things that you find in the brain. Um, everyone agrees that there has to be belief supporting information in the brain. And I'm making a more, um, I'm sticking my neck out, let's say, uh, more than Dennett does by saying that I don't think any imaging experiment can, um, you know, if, if I decide in the end to, uh, to go with a stronger thesis I mentioned, uh, that, that's sticking my neck out more than Dennett does because it's saying that you can't convert the brain, uh, sorry, the belief generating information into beliefs properly so-called without violating some sort of very intuitive conditions on what mind reading is supposed to be. And I don't think he says anything like that. Thanks, that's great. That's really great, thanks. Sure. All right, any other questions, comments? Just type Q in the chat. All right, Floor, Petit. Yes, hello. Um, I also had a, a question about the very last bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I just don't really understand what you meant by the by the weak thesis. So are you saying that it's just difficult to distinguish between false beliefs and true beliefs? False beliefs being self-deception and true beliefs being beliefs that are actually true? Because that's because this distinction doesn't depend on what a person thinks, right? It depends on the state of affairs in the world. Um, or, or what do you mean? So in the case of, uh, in Dennett's case of Tom, the, uh, I think it's, no, it might be Sam. It's, I think it's Sam, the art dealer. Um, there, it, it doesn't depend on whether his son is a great painter objectively or not. It depends entirely on whether he genuinely believes that the artwork is good or he genuinely believes that the artwork is mediocre. So I don't, I, I think it's more that, you know, it, it is about his attitude. It's not just about the external state of affairs. But, but is it then the distinction between, um, between lying by the way you behave? Okay, but um, you might use different 
parts of the brain when you're lying as opposed to when you're uh, yeah so that's very good so, so a very natural uh, way to expand this is by connecting it to the literature on um, fMRI as a lie detection mechanism or I mean there's other stuff too there's like EEG can be used uh, um, and to be honest I just haven't uh, digested that literature yet so I I don't know exactly what the connection ought to be but you're right that um, lie detection and self-deception have deception in common um, and so yeah if, if, if there was like a clear neural signature of deception um, that would that would at least force a kind of clarification in what I said at the end of the talk. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, whether that counts as detecting self-deception um, versus, yeah, that's more complicated. So I'm not sure. It's a, it's a very good question. And, uh, I have to think about it. Okay, thank you. All right. Further questions? So, I, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I'm curious uh, what people think in particular about this idea that beliefs are uh, essentially propositional, and if they are, um, that uh, in order to count as mind reading, the model that you're using should be expected to deliver a proposition as output. So shall we use a poll or you want some more detailed answers? Well, I mean, I, it would be nice if this question were sufficiently clear that a poll would be useful, but I don't know if people I don't know how clear I've been, so I don't know whether a poll would work. Okay, we have one. Okay, yeah, go ahead. And uh, if you can do that frictionlessly, uh, it would be cool for people to so, jump in. You wanna do polling? Yeah, sure, let's do it. Okay, so so what's the question? Can, can, we, can we state it? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll state it again. So this is, I hope I'm not being too selfish here um, because this is where I'm myself quite unclear and I'm trying to make some progress. But the idea is that beliefs differ from other kinds of mental content because they are essentially propositional. So if we were to say that a um, experimental setup succeeded in decoding a person's beliefs or reading a person's beliefs from their neural data, um, then that, the, the model involved in that experiment would have to deliver as output a piece of propositional content. It, it would not be sufficient for it to predict some property of a stimulus or some property of the experimental condition. The model should spit out a sentence. And uh, that's the only legitimate way that we should it would only be if, if that, uh, yeah, so just summarizing, um, the only legitimate output for belief decoding would be propositional output. So that was sort of the central idea in the end of the talk. And I'm curious whether that makes sense to people. Yeah, it does. It makes a lot of sense. I think it's brilliant, really. Okay, cool. Yeah. No, I, it, uh, sorry, vote of confidence is, is very helpful. <laughs> a lot of a lot of confidence over here. Okay, good. I'm trying to figure out how the polling works, but in the meantime, uh, well, we can also just ask, you know, if, if anyone yeah. decides that they want to verbally jump in. Right. So in the meantime, uh, uh, Louise Roscoe Hardy had a question. So go ahead, Louise. Um, yes, um, I have a question about belief fragments. What are belief fragments supposed to be? Um, uh, when you, the, uh, the quote from uh, uh, Snape and uh, Harry Potter, 
uh, is of course reminiscent of various accounts of memory. And one of the uh, leading accounts of human memory ha uh, is generative and reconstructive. No one or very few people think that the memories are stored and we look them up. Uh, they are uh, uh, reconstructed in context and then re-encoded. Now, if we um, take the, the, that as a, as a possible model for compiling, let's say, compiling propositions, what are the belief fragments supposed to be? What are the fragments supposed to be? In the case of uh, memory, they're memory traces. But um, what might they be in the case of belief? Yeah, so that's a, a very hard question. The relationship between memory and belief is tough because the right. philosopher's understanding of a belief is, from a psychological perspective, a totally weird category. Um, but it might be a totally weird category that we can't do without. Uh, but, but I'll give you two answers. And I, I, I don't know whether either of them will be very helpful, but, but we'll see. So um, if memory is reconstructed, um, then the belief fragments I was talking about are whatever uh, beliefs, uh, sorry, memories are reconstructed from. Right? So, so obviously there has to be a lot of overlap between uh, semantic memory and the information relevant to my beliefs. Uh, so yeah, th they have the same sort of informational core. Um, that's the first pass answer. But then let me just expand on the comment about the weirdness of the concept of belief from an empirical psychological point of view. Um, the, the, the philosophical notion of belief is supposed to cover an, ama an amazing range of cases. So it's supposed to cover um, you know, my belief that I'm currently in a room and uh, my belief that God does not exist. Uh, you know, so it goes from the totally mundane to the highly theoretical and grandiose. And um, it's not clear that when we try to understand the mind in terms of sort of natural psychological kinds, we're going to find one that corresponds neatly to beliefs. Um, so that, that's related to my, uh, maybe one other side note there. I think there's even empirical work um, on whether there are words in other languages uh, that correspond to the sort of English language philosopher's concept of belief. And the results are quite mixed. So um, I'm a German speaker. And even in German, you know, where there's a lot of discussion of the same ideas, it's not so clear that there's a good translation of the word belief. So it might not be a very universal thing, but if I may, it, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, if I may ask him, I don't think that the um, the issue actually um, has to do with the content of what a belief. Uh, might be. For example, you mentioned two extremes that God doesn't exist, or let's say that uh, Antwerpen uh, is in the Netherlands. Um, just if we look at the way interdisciplinary work, we find that philosophers often have a, a, a propositional conception of belief as necessary and sufficient conditions uh, for something to be true, a, a, a state of affairs or something. And if you work with psychologists, beliefs are constructs. Um, um, we may have a problem simply um, because we're talking about uh, talking about belief as if it's clearly it's clear to everybody what a belief is. And I think maybe that's the place to start. And there are some people who believe that beliefs are dis dispositions. I mean, the, the idea that it has to be a hardcore proposition. I think comes from the influence of language on our expression of belief. Um, yeah, yeah. Because it's, uh, and my suspicion is that the propositional uh, compiler is um, uh, syntactic compositionality. But um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I uh, am very sympathetic to the idea that beliefs are not natural psychological kinds, right? They're not. Uh, so I, I'm quite sympathetic. 
uh, to a dispositionalist view. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I wouldn't want to do, and, and you know, I'm even sympathetic to the idea that animals, you know, who don't have, uh, you know, generative sort of language like like humans do, um, also have beliefs. But so I guess I, um, I I want it to include uh, both implicit and explicit states. And yeah, perhaps you're right. That's uh, maybe there's a philosophical mistake there uh but it seems like we need some way of connecting our uh you know humans go back and forth between implicit attitudes and explicit attitudes and there's got to be some traffic between them right so we wouldn't want to define beliefs as exclusively sort of non-propositional things that 